We've been in a sermon series for a while now, making the right choices and choosing to do things God's way rather than our, than our own and so many choices that we make in our lives. And I was thinking about uh, praying this week and we were talking, had two or three people we were talking about prayer and I was saying, you know, that would be a good, a good choice to make if we choose to pray, wouldn't it? How many think that would be a good choice to make? And uh, learning to pray like Jesus did. How many of you would like to pray like He did? Sure we would. And uh, what are some things we do besides pray when trouble comes our way? What do we do? We worry. We worry, don't we? Uh, how about when, it, when the going gets really tough, we, what do we do instead of pray? We worry. What about when your finances go belly up? And none of you ever, that's, all of you are rich, I know. Y'all have all got it all together. You don't have any financial needs, right? Yeah. Uh, how about when people mistreat or talk about you? What do we do instead of pray? Cry, we, yeah, we cry and we, we, talk, we try to get them back or whatever. Uh, what, what about if you're faced with a dreaded disease, what do we do? We worry, don't we? And we, we, you know, we, we try to work it out, but we, uh, what are some things you do instead of pray? Think about that for a moment. As we make our choices in life, uh, we acknowledge, you know, in, when we choose to pray, as we make these choices in life, when we pray, we are, we are admitting our need for His guidance and help, aren't we? When you pause to pray. we choose to pray, we're choosing to communicate on a personal level with the one who cares the most about, most about us and, and about our needs. Today, I want to encourage you and challenge you to choose to pray. I mean, it sounds so simplistic, but folks, we, many times we don't choose to pray. We choose to, to worry or something else. Let's look at the words of Jesus this morning in Luke chapter 11 beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Luke doesn't conclude with the, with the benediction, but what's the rest of it? For thine... Amen. Think about that. Uh, in these few verses, Jesus unlocks a powerful secret to those of us that li are living on the earth. Powerful secret. This powerful weapon that we Christians possess unleashes the power of heaven on earth. Think about that for a minute. Thy will be done on earth as it is... Listen, we've got a connection to heaven in which we can unleash the power of heaven on the earth. This link to heaven cannot and will not be interrupted by weather, magnetic pulse, solar flares, uh, wars between nations, demons, Satan, lack of internet. <laughs> this connection always goes through and always can go through and always will go through as long as we are alive and remain on planet earth. This link to heaven is always there. Go to Matthew chapter 6 and let's read the, the, other, the same, same prayer but a little uh, different rendering from Matthew and see how Matthew puts it. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 9, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And here's the benediction he puts on it. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I like the benediction, don't you, on there? Because it reminds us of who we're talking to. And it reminds us of His coming kingdom. And I look forward to that day when the kingdom of Christ is set up upon this earth in which mankind will live in peace and harmony. There won't be any war. and There won't be any pain and misery on this earth. And I look forward to that, that time. But this powerful link that Jesus is trying to connect us up with is uh, this unbreakable bond between heaven and earth whereby God's children can get through to their Heavenly Father 24-7, 365 days a year for as long as they dwell on this earth. Folks, that's a good deal, isn't it? 
And, and we ought to choose to pray. Dear Jesus, help us always to choose to pray. The first thing I want to point out today from this passage of Scripture and in this prayer was the fact that Jesus was a man of prayer. Jesus not only taught prayer and encouraged prayer, but He was a man of prayer, although He was also the God-man. You realize Jesus was not just God's little boy. Jesus was 100% God, 100% man at the same time. God incarnate deity is what the song says. You know, when we sing uh, those songs at, at Christmas time and about Emmanuel, God with us, it's talking about God becoming a human and living in a human body. He was 100% God, 100% man at the same time. That's why what he says has precedent and has more importance than anybody else. Any other religious leader that's ever come or gone has nothing to say over what Jesus says because he was the God-man. The Creator God that became a human. And Jesus, being that, He was still on the earth a man of prayer. Second thing is that I want to point out about this, is, or the first thing I want to point out about this is the fact that Jesus prayed in the morning. Mark chapter 1 verse 35 says, Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out unto a sol isolated place to pray. Jesus prayed in the morning. How many of you do your quiet time in the morning? I'm like a morning bird. I get up chirpy, you know, and I'm just ready to roll at about 5.30 or 6. I start waking. My body wakes up. I can lay there and make myself go a little longer, but I can't because I'm ready to get up, and that's when I do my quiet time. I get in there, and nobody else around, and do my quiet time. And, and see, Jesus was the same way. How many of you do yours at night? Nothing wrong with that. See, Jesus not only prayed in the morning, He prayed in the evening too, so that's okay too. So it's just, we just need to choose to pray. Uh, in the garden, He prayed. It, went, it was after the, the evening meal, they went into the garden and prayed. Uh, sometimes Jesus prayed all night. Uh, Luke 6, 12, came to pass in those days that He went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Now, I've never prayed all night continually. I've prayed a through the night, and I've got up in the night and prayed, but I've never prayed. How many of you have ever prayed all night, word for word? I mean, never stopped talking to him. You... Yeah. yeah, but one person. You've been... He was constant. We've done that. But I've never actually been like him, prayed continually for the whole night. Folks, that's a lot of praying. So he prayed in the morning, he prayed at night, he prayed all night. Uh, sometimes he prayed in private. He withdrew himself to that wilderness and prayed in Luke 5. And sometimes he prayed in public. Uh, Matthew 14, when he was out there with the multitudes, he said he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and two fishes. Looking up to heaven, he blessed it and broke it. and gave the loaves to his disciples and the, and the disciples to the multitude. So, folks, Jesus was a man of prayer. And if Jesus was a man of prayer and he was the God man, he thought he needed prayer, I think I need prayer too. And I think every other human being in, on the earth really needs prayer. They just might not realize it. But Jesus said also that His church is to be a house of prayer. Churches need to be a house of prayer. In Matthew chapter 21, starting with verse 12, it said, Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. God wants His house to be called a house of prayer. But you know what? Many churches have abandoned prayer today. They have a lot of meetings and they have a lot of stuff going on, but they have very little prayer. In fact, a lot of places have prayer meeting every Wednesday night and they never do anything but pray for one time in the whole time. You know, How many of you think that's a problem? Huh? Why, why is that a problem? Some of you didn't raise your hand. You don't think that's a problem. You don't think prayer meeting... You think we need to pray on prayer meeting night? Yeah, okay. I, I, maybe you were asleep. I was going to wake you up there. Jesus said His, his house is to be a house of prayer, and, but many churches have abandoned that. But true churches are houses of prayer. Would you say amen if you believe that? Would you say, preacher, you're telling the truth if you believe that, huh? Am I telling the truth? Because I'm quoting the words of Jesus. The churches and true churches, His churches are to be houses of prayer. Now, that being said, Jesus wants Christians to pray. That sounds simplistic, doesn't it? But listen, Jesus wants you to pray. If you're a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, you love the Lord, Jesus wants you to pray. See, He told us who to pray for. Who, would, who in this passage of Scripture are you praying for in that Lord's Prayer? Think back for a minute. I'm not going to put it up there for you. I'm going to let you think for a minute. Who are you praying for? 
Are you praying for yourself? Yes. How are you praying for yourself there? Give us this day our day. Okay. How, how are you praying for other people? Huh? <laughs> forgive me, but forgive them. He told you to pray for yourself, pray for other people. He also told you what to pray for. What did, what did, the, what did he say to pray for in that passage of Scripture? Food? Yeah. See, we take that for granted, don't we? His will to be done on earth as it is. Hey, park there for a minute. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Think about that. I, something just, I must be losing it or something because that jumped all over me this week. Why do I always pray, Lord, if it's your will, do this. Why not pray, Lord, in heaven, it's this way, would you do it on earth? Huh? He said, whatever's on earth, he said, whatever's in heaven, thy will be done on heaven as it is in earth, or on earth as it is in heaven. Is everybody well in heaven? Yeah. Do people not die in heaven? Yeah. There's all sorts of stuff that heaven is better than here, that the things that are better there. Why don't we start praying as if God can do a miracle? Instead of, oh, if you want to. No. He says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why not start praying with more faith and believing? I'm start, I, quit, I quit praying the old way. I started praying a new way this week. When the Lord showed that to me, I said, I'm sorry, Lord, I won't lack faith again. I'm going to start praying the, the will of heaven on earth like you tell me to. Why not? You know, I look at people that are, that are battling. We, we drove to Panama City the other night, Tuesday night, and uh, prayed over Todd Blair. Remember praying for Todd Blair on Wednesday night? He's dying of cancer up there. And his, his uh, cousin said, would you go up there with me and let's pray for him and anoint him with oil? I said, absolutely. When are we leaving? He said, 3 o'clock. I'll pick you up. Picked me up in Otter Creek. We drove to Panama City. Spent about an hour and a half in the hospital room. Drove back <laughs> that night. That's a, you've been to Panama City lately? That's a long way. Now, why in the world would we go to that extreme? Well, number one, because my brother asked me to. Number two, the Word of God tells you that when somebody's sick and they call for the elders, that you're supposed to anoint him with oil. So when I prayed the prayer over Todd, in, as far as the doctors are concerned, he has no hope. But listen, I, there's great hope in heaven. Now, he knows Jesus. God may take him home and heal him there. But I ask him to extend his days and give him some time with us and heal him here a little bit. <laughs> give his body strength to heal itself so we can see him a little longer. There were eight people in the room. One of his, one of his brothers is, all, I wouldn't say an atheist, but almost. He was there. He, he joined in the circle of prayer with us when we gathered around Todd. I was able to share the gospel with all eight at the same time the same time, all the way through the gospel. And then we said the sinner's prayer out loud and we all held hands. Now, I don't, I don't know what happened to his brother. His brother's name's Cole. But you pray for Cole that Cole came across to the Lord's side that night. He hadn't been open at all to the gospel. But God opened his heart that night and he was willing to listen and he was willing to pray for his brother. And I prayed that, that you know, God... You know, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. Give Todd, give Todd a little more time here. Do like you did King Hezekiah. Extend his days. Now, God takes him home. I'm not going to be mad at God. And I'm not going to think I'm, I'm an idiot for saying that. I'm going to say, Lord, I understand now that was, that was your will. He wanted him to go home. But why not ask God for the, to, to bring heaven down rather than just always being on the defensive? Let's be on the offensive. And pray God's pray the, the will of heaven here on the earth. Believe in that. I believe in a. I don't believe in a dime store God, folks. I believe in a big God. <laughs> I believe a God that can do anything. I believe in the God that spoke the universe into existence, and and He wants His people to believe and and trust Him for big things. And I would encourage you to do that. So He told us what to pray for. Uh, he He said, "When you pray, not if you pray. When you pray, do it this way. It's not. It's not. Well, if you decide to pray, He expects us to pray. He wants us to pray." And when you pray, He told us how to do it. And He told us why to pray. Why to pray. Why should we pray, by the way? Why do we pray? Why do you pray? Okay. Why else do you pray? To enjoy communication. Why else do you pray? Pardon? Fellowship? Good. Why do you pray? Okay. Why do you pray? Why do you pray? All those are true, but I hadn't heard the real reason. Why do you pray? 
Uh, there you go. You get the prize. Okay. See me afterwards. I got a prize in my office for you. You said it. He told us to, didn't he? And so why? You know, he told us why to pray. He told us to pray. He wants us to pray. He wants us to call on him. You know, the, the, God's phone number. I think it's Jeremiah thirty-three, three. Call on me, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou show, knoweth not. <laughs> you call on him. So listen. We we know why to pray. Also, the other reason we need to pray is that listen. Do you know we are all in a mess? How many of you think you're a mess? Listen, we're all in a mess, okay? People that think they're not a mess and they think they got it all together, they just don't know their true heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? See, people are trying to figure out why these people are doing mass killings and all that stuff. And they're trying to, what is the motive behind that? And why did they do that? Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's why. It, they, it wasn't because their mama put them on the potty crooked. It wasn't because of their environment. No, I'm seriously, we, we've been taught a, a bunch of bull by so-called psychologists that are sometimes nuts themselves. They need, the, they need the psychiatry. They need the counseling most of the time. Listen, the reason people do stuff is because they're evil, okay? Mankind has an evil intent in their heart because they're sinners that haven't been saved. Now, even saved people can do bad stuff, okay? Why? Because we have that old bent, that old uh, pattern there of sin. We like to do what we want to do when we want to do it. And we don't like to, anybody to tell us anything. We especially don't want God telling us anything. You see, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When Adam and Eve fell, something died in the human psyche. You see, man is a body, soul, and a spirit. Your body is your physical. Your soul is your personality, who you, who you are. And then your spirit is what was created, just like God. And the moment Adam and Eve sinned, their physical body didn't die that day. Remember, God says, when you eat it, you'll die. Their physical body didn't die. They lived to be 900 back in those days. Seven, eight, nine hundred years old. Listen, their body didn't die right then, even though death came as a result of it. Their personality didn't die. They were still who they were. Something died, and it was the spiritual part of them. The spiritual part of them that walked with God in the garden every day and communed with Him, boom, it was gone. It was, it was just a, a dead little thing there inside of a human being. And when salvation comes, He says, You He hath made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. He makes that, that human uh, spirit that used to be like God, he, he, uh, in life, he makes it alive again, and it begins to grow. Now listen, people, why do people do evil things? People do evil things because they're sinners. Sinners like to sin. Some do worse than others. Some people say, well, I, I know that salvation business. That's for those kind of people. I'm a good person. I do this and I do that and I help my community and I give to UNICEF and I give to, to the, the boys club and I give to, to uh, wherever, all the different places, you know, the, when they come around with the March of Dimes, I give to them and I give to my church and I do good works and I, and I don't hurt, whole, you know, I help little ladies across the street and I, and I don't hurt people. And See, they think because they're good in the sense of what we think are good, they're, they're going to make it into heaven because of that. Listen, we can't get into heaven by being a good person. You hear me? Why do, why do we need to pray? Well, you can't get into heaven by being a good person. You say, now, I think we need more good people. How many think we'd like to have more good people on there? Yeah, I like good people. I want to live around good people. I'm glad I have good neighbors that are good people. But listen, that will not get us into heaven. Because there's, a, there's an entrance requirement for heaven. Is, can anybody here tell me what the entrance requirement to heaven is? Huh? What's the entrance requirement for a human being to get in on their own merit? What's the entrance requirement? Perfection. That's it. If you, you want to get in by just being a human and being a good person, you achieve perfection, you're going to get in. How many of you have ever gotten... How many of you are perfect? How many of you have ever known a perfect person? There's only been one. You know who his name was? Jesus. That's the only perfect person. Only perfect one that ever kept God's law completely. You know what the Bible says? It says, if you break God's law one time, once, you're guilty of breaking all of the Ten Commandments, you know. That's kind of scary because, man, I broke one or two of them for sure. You probably broke some too, right? Some of you might have broke four. <laughs> you know? Think about think of it this way. 
suppose I would have uh, Fred over for, for breakfast. I say, Fred, bring your buddies. Your buddies are Phil and Pete, right? And we'd, th we'd bring John. John would come, you know. And I'm going to make them an omelet, okay? So we start cra The other morning, you know how many eggs we cracked for, for the men's breakfast and the teachers? We, uh, uh, Twelve dozen. That's how many eggs we cooked the other day. Now, for these guys, I'd probably only do a dozen and a half because we'd make a big omelet and we'd mix all kind of good stuff. We're cracking eggs, and the last two eggs are rotten. Okay, and everything's fine, but the last two eggs. And I say, well, we're going to have to, it won't be enough if I don't do it, so I'm going to, they won't know. I'll just mix it in there. Now, let me ask you a question. Would they know there were rotten eggs in the bunch? Have you ever smelled rotten eggs? Think of your life. You think you are a good person. And you might, you might have, out of your 12 eggs, you might have all 11 right. But you've got one rotten one in there. And you mix that up and you serve it to God and, and God goes... <laughs> <laughs> you see why it's impossible to get to heaven by just being a, a good person? You can't. Because you, you at least have one or two sins. Just like a rotten egg that's mixed in there and it ruins the rest of it. Listen, why do we need to pray? We need to pray because we're not going to get into heaven without Him. The Jesus that taught this prayer is trying to point out something to us that we need Him. We can't get in on our own. As good as you might think you are, you're not good enough. As bad as you think you are, you're not bad enough. Listen, He did it all for you. He took the worst of the worst and the best of the best and He said, call on me and I'll let you come in. Believe on me and I'll take you in free, free of charge. Ride my back. I'm going to take you in. That's pretty goggling good news, isn't it? How many of you say that's good news? See, why do you need to pray? You need to pray because you won't get there without Him. Okay, you need to pray and, and learn that prayer is so critical and so important. And the number one reason we need to pray is to make sure we have a good relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. We've asked Him for the free gift of salvation because He bought, the, he bought a ticket for you. It's stamped with your name on it. And all it's waiting on is for you to pick it up. It's already there. It's already your name's on it. Signed with His blood. Paid. Your trip is paid to heaven. And all it's waiting on is you to say, Thank you, Lord. I accept that. And I believe that. And see, that, that moment, that moment, you're transferred from death to life. You're, you're pardoned forever. That's pretty good news, isn't it? That's good news, yeah. So He told us why to pray. He also told us how to pray. He gave us a, a kind of a, a pattern, didn't He? Now, he told us how our prayers are supposed to sound. Okay, some of you are worried about how your your prayers sound, and you don't you're worried about the words. Listen, forget about the words. I hear people sometimes, and they they throw King James English all over it. Thine and thou art, and you know they get real loud, and they they use the big words. I'm thinking, come on, just talk to God. Leave all that other stuff out. And talk to Jesus, okay? Because I mean, the big words are not the the critical thing. Uh, it, and it's not in repetitious phrases that people use a lot of times. In Matthew 6, right above that same passage I read, he said, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what, ye, what things you have need of before you ask Him. He already knows what you need. So don't just repetitively say it over and over. Have you ever listened to the Hare Krishnas do their chant? sad and you know, I feel sorry for them. I love them. I love their souls. I don't want them to die and go to hell. But they, but they chant and they chant and they chant the same repetitive phrase. Oh, you see a lot of religions are like that. They go over through these repetitive things over. Jesus says don't pray like that. And don't pray in a showy fashion. Remember this one story when Jesus in fact Luke 18 I'll read it to you. Two men went up into the temple to pray. Verse 10, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus to himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. And the publican standing afar off would not even lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus speaking said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Jesus said, don't be showy with your prayer. The Pharisee was a very religious person. They were so religious. I have this pen, a little Liberty Bell pen on my coat. 
They wouldn't even wear that on the Sabbath because that would be carrying a load on the Sabbath. They'd be working on the Sabbath. That's how religious they were. And so, the, yeah, that publican, he was, he, was, he was over there praying, I'm a, I'm a righteous man. And Jesus said, oh, the sinner over here got in before he did. You know, And the sinner just, a little one word, two word prayer, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. God let him in. He said, that's the one that went home justified. You see, not in repetitious phrases, not in showy fashions, or in uh, showy fashion. The simpler, the better, okay? The simpler, the better. I love the simple prayers. Some of the neatest prayers I've ever heard were by new Christians that didn't know how to pray. <laughs> that sounds funny, that didn't know how to pray. But boy, they didn't know how to pray. I had one down there, old Sam Owens, and he and his boys came to Christ and started walking with the Lord. And, and Sam would pray and he said, Lord, it's old Sam again. <laughs> so he said, what he just what he said, Lord, it's old Sam again. We are, we're in a mess down here. People are sure messing up. And our country is going the wrong way. And they, you know, a lot of people don't love you. But Lord, we do. We sure need your help. And, and this bunch of people right here I'm with today, we're calling on you for some help. I thought to myself, man, I, tears welled up in my eyes. I said, that's a real prayer. That's a real prayer, you know. And others like him. And Dick Sheever and some of the other men we won to Christ that were rank, rank heathens before they got saved. And they became such prayer warriors. To hear them pray, I, just, I would hope they get called on because I wanted to hear real prayer. You know, I didn't want to hear the, the repetitive stuff that we all have heard our whole life. I wanted to hear real prayer. And I think God does too. The simpler, the better. And one of the simplest prayers in the Bible is found in 1 Kings 18. And I want somebody to... Who, who has a smartphone? Put your timer on. I want you to time me in a minute. I want you to time this prayer. When I drop my finger, Candace, I want you to time it, okay? In a minute. But it's the story of Elijah on that God contest on Mount Carmel. When he was up there by himself against the king and all their people. and had 450 prophets of Baal against him and 400 other false prophets. And they all were going against this one guy. And he's the one that lined up the contest. He said, let's have a God contest. We'll put an altar here and, and put stones around it and put an, an animal on it. And the God that brings fire out of heaven, that's the one we'll worship. And they said, yeah, we'll do that. So all day long, the, the other side was do, doing their chants and they were cutting themselves and doing all the religious nonsense and rigmarole that people do in, in pagan religion, trying to bring fire out of heaven. And, and after the whole day was over, and he, he even started making fun of them after a while and saying, what's the matter? Is your, your, God, your God on a vacation? Or maybe he's going to the bathroom or something, you know? Where's your God? And no fire came. And here, it, finally it was his turn. It was almost evening. And he said, okay, boys, now it's my turn. You've all had your turn. Now it's my turn. Elijah's turn now. Verse seven, uh, six, 36. 1 Kings 18, 36. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said... Now, Candace, get ready. You ready? Here's his prayer. Go. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I, I, am, I am thy servant, that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. And Stop it. 17, a 17.62 second prayer. That wasn't very long, was it? Pretty simple, wasn't it? But you know what happened? Fire came down from heaven and burned the sacrifice up. And he had set the stage in such a way that it was no possible way that stuff could ever burn because they saturated it with water. They wet the wood down and the animal down, poured water all around the fire, where the fire was going to be so just so there wouldn't be any mistake of the God that came with fire. And, and the fire of God fell, burned the sacrifice, and then it licked up the water. And the people said, The Lord he is God! The Lord! You see... The power of a simple prayer, praying to the God of heaven, and God answered miraculously, but it was the simpler, the better. <laughs> you remember Mr. Esposito a long time ago? Mr. Esposito, godly Italian man. And he talked with the accent, I like it. But you wouldn't want to call on him to pray at the end of the service. Because he would pray for how long? How long would you how long would he would you say? Ten? Ten minutes? Minimum of 10 minutes. To a kid, it was like 30 minutes. We'd be praying, Oh, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, please don't, Daddy, please don't call on Mr. Esposito. Please, 
please, please, please, please, please. We were wanting to leave and go to lunch, and he was going to call to Mr. Esposito. And Mr. Esposito would be praying. And, and what he was saying was wonderful. He's great, great words and great, you know, godly principles and stuff. But we little kids, we were wanting to go to the bathroom. We want to go to eat. And it was long, you know. And, uh, but I, lo I loved him. And he always, Mr. Tony, he said, oh, Lord told me um, he's going to come back before I go to heaven. And so, but he didn't. So Mr. Tony's been in heaven now for 30 to 40 years. I can't wait to see him. And you know what? I can't wait to hear him pray again. I understand now his prayer more than I understood then. I was just a kid thinking, oh man, please not Mr. Esposito. But now I wish I could hear his voice once again. Because he was one of the godly men of our church that I love dearly and, and was one of the backbone of that Southside Baptist Church in which this church came out of. But see, the, the simpler, the better. Don't worry about your words or how flashy it sounds. Don't Just pray to God like you would your best friend. Okay? Don't worry about how it sounds. Don't worry about having to use uh, big theological terms. and Just pray. Just pray. So what are the right, right words of prayer? What are the right words? And I thought of a simple plan that I learned a long time ago, and some of you probably use this to this day, and a lot of it comes right out of that same passage. But the first thing you want to do is praise Him. Praise Him. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <laughs> see, he's praising Him, isn't he? And see, you can go through the Psalms, and the Psalms are full of praise. Pick out a Psalms. If you don't know, you can't find a Psalms, pick up a hymn book and borrow a hymn book from a church. We won't care. You can take one home with you. We don't care. And bring it back someday. Copy the, the praise hymns out of that. Uh, if you're at a, at a used bookstore, they've always got hymnals there. Find a hymnal that has praise music in it and read it to Him. Just read it to God. Second thing, thank Him. Be thank, have an attitude of thanksgiving. Thank Him for what He's done. So many times we're, we're ungrateful for what we already have. So stop and thank Him for what He's already done for you. Third thing, confess your sins to Him. Whatever that God has pointed out is wrong in your life, that's when you want to confess them to Him. Fourth thing is intercede for other people. Intercession. You want to pray for others when, as in that prayer, what did they? What did you pray for other people? Forgive them as, yeah. You forgive them as God forgave you. You're praying for other people. There's a whole lot of stuff you can pray for for other people. We want to pray for uh, Todd Blair, who's up in, in intensive care in uh, a hospital in Miramar up by Pensacola. We want to pray for uh, anybody else that calls on us for prayer. We want to continue. That's the time for intercession when we pray for others. Uh, petition means you ask for what you need. You petition God. How many of you need something from God right now? You want to petition Him. That's when you petition heaven. and That's when you pray the will of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. That's when you pray that. You ask Him for that. You see, that's an easy uh, five-point way to pray. It's just a real effective way. So, as we conclude today, prayer is good. How many of you just say prayer is good? Would you say that with me? Prayer is good. Second thing, prayer is simply talking to God. Say that with me. Sometimes prayer is private. Sometimes it's public. But say E with me. Jesus wants us all to pray. Say that with me. Jesus wants us all to pray. Don't worry about how good it sounds and don't say too much, but say it with me. Just pray. Now, my CEF people are going to like this. I don't have it up on the screen, but how many of you know the song, Why Worry? Steve knows it. Who else? Monty knows it. Why worry when you can pray? How many of you know that song? We're going to teach it to you right now. Okay? And here's the first sentence. Why worry when you can pray? Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sing the, sing the line, then you're going to sing it right behind me. And I'm going to sing the second line, you're going to sing it right behind me. Okay? So I'm going to read it to you first so you'll kind of be aware of what it's... Why worry when you can pray? Trust Jesus. He'll be your stay. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Rest fully on His promise. Why worry, 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 worry when you can pray? Y'all ready to sing? Let's sing. Why worry when you can pray? Why worry when you can pray? Trust Jesus, He'll be your stay. Trust Jesus, He'll be your stay. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Rest fully on His promise. Why worry, 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 worry? Why worry, 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 worry? When you can pray, when you can pray, 
Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the privilege that we can come to you in prayer, Lord, and we can bring our heartfelt, deepest needs to you, Lord, and that you will help us, that you'll also, we can bring the needs of others to you, Lord. And Lord, today we magnify you for being the prayer answering God, the God that spoke the universe to existence, Lord, and we thank you for caring about people like us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. All God's children sit. Amen. What are we singing, Brother Mark? Where'd Brother Mark go? There he is. <laughs> I heard that. If you have never trusted Jesus, if you've never, when I said the why, if you've never really made that step yet, I want to encourage you to do that today, that you receive Christ as your Savior and your Lord. Pray to Him to be your Savior. We had a young man after church last week do that. And you're going to meet him in just a minute. But there may be somebody else that wants to join him. And uh, we had two more uh, Wednesday night do the same thing. So if you, if you would like to be part of that, that group that says, I am going to follow God and I'm going to quit rebelling against Him and I'm going to go His way. So that's what repentance means. We're going this way and we go, hey, I didn't realize I was in, in rebellion against God and I'm going to do it His way. So that's all it is. That's what repentance is. And we just make a decision. We're going to follow Him. If you want to do that, you come down and take me by the hand in a moment and tell me that as we sing. What are we singing, brother? Jesus is tenderly calling thee home. Let's stand together as we sing. Here it comes.